You have a great knack in your production company, I think, of tapping into contemporary concerns, you know, smoking and politics, teen pregnancy, the economic downturn. Uh, but there's possibly none bigger than our relationship with technology and, and with each other. And I wondered what it was about the, the original novel, Chad Kilker's novel, that resonated with you. And, and was there also an immediate, you know, um, cinematic potential to, to the novel? Did you, did you see that from the get-go? Jason, would you like to, to start? Yeah, it? certainly. You know, it's funny. Uh, it, uh, the, the heroes of my movies have always been you know, the head lobbyist for big tobacco or a pregnant teenage girl or a guy who fires people for a living or a woman who's trying to ruin someone else's marriage. I have a strange like, concept of what a hero is, and uh, I, I've always seen the things that you just referred to as really locations. Smoking is a location for a movie about freedom of choice, and in this case, technology is a location for a movie about relationships and intimacy. And what I loved about the book was that it found a way into kind of the raw details of what it's like to be in, a, in love in 2014. And Helen, what about you? What about you? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think that's exactly it. It's the relationships that really, that you see so strongly in the book too. And, and I think that the, um, the technology aspect is wonderful. And I think that, you know, Jason and the team did an amazing job of showing that on the screens, on screen and everything like that. But it's really, it's the relationships that always got it. Okay. And Ansel, one for you just before we open it to, um, to the floor. Can you tell us what you responded to in the script? I mean, was it the themes? Was it the, the humor? Was it the characters? What, what was it excited you about the project? Um, yeah, I think it's the same thing. So what they're saying is that it's a, it's a timeless story. Really, it's a story about uh, that covers a lot of things, but it it does set it is set in this such a current way. I don't think a movie a story has been told or a movie has been told in this um, with this like current lens yet, which where like technology has changed the way that we interact with people, and it has changed the way that we have relationships, and it also has changed us. So I think it's interesting to tell a story about a bunch of characters. And you really see how technology has affected them. Um, and uh, it's, this movie has scared a lot of people. And I think when I read the script, it's like sort of, you know, it scares you. But what movie and art supposed to do is make you talk about things. And I think this is the first movie that really like opens up that conversation of, like, of how is technology changing things. And um, this really brings it to the extreme, but I think it does it, and it's really appropriate, and it really was time for a movie like this. Mm -hmm. So when I read the script, I was like, I have to be a part of this. Um, Jason, we have a, a couple of uh, British connections to this. Um, you're mm -hmm. the composer, Bibio, but I do have to ask you the Emma Thompson question, mm -hmm. I feel. Um, why was her cut glass British accent the one you wanted? I mean, she sure has a way delivering those that porno language. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, when Aaron Cresta Wilson, my co-writer, and I started adapting Chad's novel, we wanted to find a way to work in all of Chad's narration and description. And we imagined Voyager, this spacecraft, which we launched in the 70s, looking back on Earth, and, and we thought, who would be the voice of Voyager, looking back on humanity, giving us this kind of cold but humorous look, uh, as though observing animals in the wild. And... And, and we just started thinking about Emma's voice. It's how witty it is, how smart it is, and how she gets away with being naughty in a really intelligent way. And I don't know anyone else who can do that. So it went from being, wow, that's a good idea, to a desperation and hope that she would say yes. And uh, I actually met her last year at Toronto Film Festival and suggested the film, and she read it. Uh, and when she recorded it all in one fell swoop. She did a few changes along the way, but we met at a rock and roll studio in Hollywood, and, and she threw the whole thing down without ever watching a frame of the film. It's funny, because, you know, uh, Juno was made in uh, 2006 or 2007, and we, we had set it just a little bit earlier, just so we could get away from cell phones, and... Yeah, it's, it's been, God, uh, seven or eight years, and we've gone from the hamburger phone to the iPhone. I mean, that's the transition from Juno to this film. And uh, it, from touring high schools on Juno and seeing these buildings that were built in the 60s and 70s and there were, everything was made out of wood and, and, and in trying to capture the feel of what a high school was then to now where we were touring a school in Texas where there were no lockers because there are no books. 
and there were device days and non-device days. And there were classrooms where kids had earbuds in, uh, in the middle of class. And I asked an administrator, what are they listening to? And he said, I don't know, maybe music? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think the film definitely like leaves you not wanting to look at your phone at the end of the film. Um, and if like you look at the person next to you and they're on their phone, you should just, like th hit them on the top of the head and be like, "Didn't you learn anything from that?" <laughs> but it's, I mean, it's not that. This film doesn't say like, "Oh, put your phone away. Technology's bad and all this stuff." I think it just one of the things it says is like, human connection is what's important here. That's like the reason why we got these smartphones. It's so that we can connect, and. Uh, I know it's cheesy, whatever, and everyone's saying it, but like it's true. Everyone is sort of disconnecting now. Everyone got these smartphones to connect, and everyone's disconnecting. So, personally, I've started to use it less. I think everyone will start to use it less for a little, as long as it's cool. Because now that like art and like this movie, and there's like a bunch of like, you know, social campaigns saying like, look up and don't use your phone all the time. Uh, now it's going to be popular culture not to use your phone. So that's good. People are going to get off a little bit. And then there's going to be something new that comes out that's really cool again. And then people are going to be totally addicted to that. That's the way the world works. <laughs> and Helen and Jason, have you moderated your, your use of, uh, <coughs> of technology since, since the movie? Oh, I am. Um, <laughs> the day we stopped shooting, I actually drove back from Austin to LA and turned off my phone for five straight days, which was the hardest thing I have ever done. Um, uh, but it was a fun experiment, and I don't know if it was directly in response to this. It was also <coughs> directly in response to a very busy fall, but um, but it was interesting, and it was interesting to see in the context of all of this, sort of how that affects. Uh, well, how it sort of affected me and my head and also how it affected everyone else that I was used to having me constantly available at every moment. So it was a fun little experiment that I probably won't try again. <laughs> <laughs> you just... Uh, I, I'm envious of that experiment. I, I, I have become more conscientious of it, and I certainly think a lot about it when it comes to uh, my daughter. I think I'm more conscientious of when I'm on my phone in front of my daughter than anything else. And... Uh, uh, there's, there's something about it, uh, for whatever reason, there's something in the back of my head. Uh, it's funny, I remember, I remember when I made Thank You for Smoking, there was a woman I knew who was in politics, and uh, I was so excited to be making a libertarian movie, and she said, I wonder what will change when you become a father, and I said, I will never change. <laughs> and uh, there's something about when I'm on my phone in front of my daughter that makes me want to put my phone in my pocket. <laughs>